cold, black, oily darkness flowed over the boiling, writhing coils of Medusa's dresses. That oily water calmed the boiling hair, and down they sank, together, one. That is how it always had been with her, at one with the darkness. That is how it had been for me, her other half, her voice, her eyes, her hands. Who was I? No one. So I had been since I stumbled on her cottage in the forest. Snow had been falling then. I was enough of a child to play and dance and sing to the little snow fairy sitting on the snowflakes. Coblots, we Germans called them. That was long ago and far away now. The cottage had drawn me to it with those twin dark windows, glistening and beckoning like the eyes of a tiger. The little laughing spread I was disappeared between them, never to emerge again. The sprite became an imp, dark and dead, bound by oath to serve that Medusa and her twin eyes. Those eyes and mine were her only openings into the world of light. She had lost her sight through years of looking inward into darkness and needed a window not to see through, just to know what was passing around her. Ropes creaked and the police jerked my mistress from beneath the shroud of that icy water. Sheets of water streamed away like the smoke from a dying fire. The executioner's voice grated on the icy air as he shouted to his men to hold the ropes. The bishop was about to speak. Addressing his victim, his voice droned on. Those words of condemnation and reproof could never have been addressed to a worthier victim, yet they fell on dead ears. I could have told him so. I would know. My mistress' face lolled back with a wicked, toothless grin. Her one eye was flecked with red and rolled backwards. The bishop turned away, disgusted, red robes flapping away in the wind. Red, the color of blood. But not her blood. Hers was black, black as her hair, as the icy water flowing around her. The chair dropped back into the cold, dark depths. I had seen her bleed once, once, that fateful day. Her little knife nicked my skin, but I didn't cry out as my blood trickled over my arm. Then that same knife punctured her knotted skin, and black, slimy liquid oozed forth. Drop by drop, that back blackness spread on my proffered wrist. My blood, running down my arm, slowed, thickened, and darkened. I suppose my head lolled forward. The nailed fists of the guards beside me jerked my head up. Those guards were there to prevent my death, prevent my sudden plunge into the abyss before me, to join my mistress in her grave. Kind my people are, and generous, giving me a chance to live, or exist. How could I live without her, dying under the water? How could I live in the dark? I had done so for years, yet always with that guiding darkness, deeper and darker than pitch almost luminous in its blackness, leading me deeper into enslavement, but leading me somewhere. Lost in darkness would be worse than seeking deeper darkness. Where could I go? To whom could I turn? Suddenly, my legs and arms jerked, spasmodically. My head lolled back and screams tore from my parched throat. I knew it was happening. My mistress was dying, dead perhaps. She could not scream, I had to. She could not move, tied with ropes and heavy chains. I had to. The guards nearly lost their hold and jerked me upright again. Police creaked as the muscles of the executioner's men bulged. The chair came up again, empty 